uh, sources of income and influence. The reverend who testified before the House Judiciary Committee just this morning uh, and who said basically, you know, under oath, Clarence Thomas told me that our lobbying was really paying off, having an influence. Well, that just means that anyone who meets with a justice should be under an obligation enforceable by criminal law, at least to report every such meeting. So those who wine and dine Justice Alito or Justice Thomas in the increasingly exposed miasma that surrounds the court, they're the ones that we could enforce the law against. I haven't tried to work up a statute, but that's where I think Congress has to focus its attention, not just, you know, passing yet another ethics code, which can be ignored by a justice who, like Thomas, would simply thumb his nose at it. Uh, I just want to go over the unenforceability uh, a bit for the audience, because I know people think that all laws, uh, I think I think they assume that all laws have uh, penalties for noncompliance with right. laws. But in fact, a tremendous amount of the law that we write does not contain a penalty. It's, it's in effect, it would be like writing a speed limit that just says the speed limit is 65 miles an hour. In fact, what we do is we write a speed limit that says it's 65 miles an hour and you are finable by X amount or arrestable. And, and it spells out all the penalties that you, can in, that you can incur by breaking that speed limit. But there are pages and pages and pages of law, federal and state, that don't have penalties attached to them, criminal penalties, and that's what makes enforceability a challenge. Exactly, and 28 U.S. Code Section 455 is one of them. It says it shall be unlawful for a justice to do what it seems that Clarence Thomas, as a Supreme Court justice, has done. People who think that these rules don't apply to justices are wrong. They, they apply. That law applies. It uses the word justice. And the only judges in the federal system who are justices are the nine that we see all the time uh, sitting in the marble palace. They are subject to the law, but the law is not enforceable. And it's not going to be easy to figure out how best to enforce it. But I think focusing on the people who surround the justices and how, sort of prop them up and encourage them to ignore precedent, to bring their own ideology to bear rather than trying to be fair arbiters of the law, those are the people that perhaps we should go after. You know, I have no doubt. I mean, I, I used to be uh, specializing in writing tax law in the Senate, and I would always say, "What's the, uh, what's the penalty for this? If you don't, what's the price? What's the penalty?" And we, there were once in a great while in tax law, there isn't one, but that's mostly tax law has a penalty for noncompliance. I am sure that when the Judiciary Committee was writing this law about judges, someone in the corner might have said. How do we enforce it? What's the enforceability? And I'm sure the consensus was, you don't need that. No Supreme Court justice would ever dare take on the public image of violating a law like this. Well, if that's what they thought, they were being pretty naive. You know, mm -hmm. in the tax context that you were very much involved in, although there are penalties, it's really the reluctance of people to violate the law that accounts for a mm -hmm. lot of its compliance. People stop at stop signs, they don't run red lights, even if there aren't cops around, even if only a tiny percent of people are audited, the compliance rate is pretty high. And you would think that at the apex of the judicial system, the ethical constraints would be self-enforcing, but it turns out they're not. I think the ultimate solution is to have better justices and not to select the kinds of people that on occasion we've put on the court.